Dr. Alex Bazridis, thanks so much for coming back on Evolution Soup all the way from Idaho, USA. You are a professor of biology at Lewis Clark State College, where you teach human anatomy and physiology. Last time we talked about your book, Evolution Gone Wrong, The Curious Reasons Why Our Bodies Work or Don't, <laughs> exploring everything from blurry vision to bad backs. Well, today we're going to be talking about the evidence for evolution and why it has been the best explanation for the diversity of life on Earth since it was outlined by Charles Darwin over 150 years ago. So welcome back, Alex. Your book has been out for um, quite a while now, and the paperback has now been released. Um, there's an audio book as well. So how are all these uh, formats doing? Yeah, it's been really fun. It's a couple of years here coming up in May, and between all the different formats, just it just went over 10,000 copies sold, which I'm pretty thrilled about. That seems like oh, a yeah. good benchmark to achieve. It's been interesting to see sort of the way the people arrive at the book. There's like you said, there have been a fair number of people that read the that listen to the audio book. There's been quite a number of people that read the ebook, and of course, some a lot of traditional on the hardback. I've gotten a lot of. It's one of the most interesting and fun parts for me has been all the feedback from readers and all the things I've learned. You know, just sort of anecdotes from people about their anatomy and how the book related to them. And there's been I could write a whole you know other sort of addendum about sort of little things I've learned in the process. So that's been really fun. Right, time to get into the evidence for evolution because there's a lot of evidence to cover. You split these into four categories, anatomical evidence, molecular evidence, vestigial features, and transitional forms. All of these are facts explained by the theory of evolution. But before we begin, let's just look at this word theory because this sometimes causes confusion. Now, when we talk about the theory of evolution, we're talking about a scientific theory. And that's not the same as an everyday theory, is it? You're absolutely right. And I do think it has caused a lot of the confusion and, mm. and sort of <laughs> coming to loggerheads about the topic is just the semantics of this word theory. And, and what it boils down to is that there are just two uses of the word theory. There's sort of the common vernacular everyday use. And then there's the use in a scientific context. Mm. And the common use is it's like a guess. It's, it's a hunch. It's things like, you know, if your car won't start in the morning, you might have a theory about why your car doesn't start. Or if you lost your sunglasses last week, you might have a theory about where you left them. But those are just yes. those are just guesses. They're just hunches. And in the scientific manner, it's it's the complete opposite. It's the exact opposite of a guess. We use the we only use the word theory in science for an idea that has been supported by mountains of evidence and has held up to experimentation for for generations. And you know, so the the bumper sticker is a bumper sticker on my door in my office that said, "Yes, the, um, evolution is a theory, kind of like gravity, because <laughs> we use that same word for yeah. gravity. It's the theory and the law of gravity. Um, and just like gravity, there's there there are piles of evidence that have supported the theory since it was." You know, so have supported the idea since it was first proposed, like you said, 150 years ago. So we don't take that word theory lightly in science. You know, other examples would be the germ theory or mm -hmm. the theory of plate tectonics. I mean, these are all ideas that that have held up to experimentation for for through countless experiments and countless scientists. And, and as new evidence comes to light. I mean, evolution is held up all the way through the molecular and genetic revolution. We didn't even know about DNA and how genes were mm -hmm. passed on and all those kinds of things. And and yes, like you've sort of had to shape the theory in light of all those new ideas, but it it hasn't it hasn't fallen apart even under all that new evidence. So it's a word that we take very seriously in the scientific community and is the complete opposite of the way we use the word theory for just kind of throwing it around about like you know, why you got sick last week or something like that. You know, I always see it as a, a capital T theory as, yeah, as like opposed that. to the, the lowercase. The lowercase T, yeah, I like that. Okay, time to dive into that evidence. First, we're going to look at anatomical evidence, that is evidence relating to the physical structure of living things and how they look. Alex, what are the best 
anatomical evidences that you can tell us about? It's a great question, and I like to just start with our own anatomy because you carry it around with you every day, and I think there are lots of places in the human body where we can find compelling evidence for evolution. I start with the foot. So I have a model of a foot here. I brought, a, brought one over from the lab. So the foot is a, a striking example of a feature in humans that has clearly evolved. You would not design a foot this way um, to do the job that it has to do in humans. In humans, it has to sort of take a pounding. It has to allow us to walk and cover long distances. And you would not want to have something with 26 parts in it. There are 26 bones in this foot between the tarsal bones and the metatarsal bones and the phalanges. There's 26 bones in there. And it's way too many bones for, for something that whose main job is to sort of pound the, pound the ground and, and help us get around. It's because it has the evolutionary past of being an appendage that was needed for grasping and for gripping. And it had a very different job in our past. And I like it as an example of, of clear evolution in the body because there's no way you would design a foot like that for the, for its current job. But that's not the way evolution works, works, right? It has to just work with the pieces that it has in place. We know that you wouldn't design a foot like that because when we design feet, <laughs> like when somebody needs a prosthetic, we put only a couple of parts in the thing. Like sometimes a, a prosthetic foot only has two or three pieces in it. And that's the way you would design a foot to, to walk around. So the foot is a really good example. And you contrast that with a prosthetic hand, right? Like a prosthetic hand has a very different job. So when you make a prosthetic hand, it does need to have all these, these movable parts that are to allow somebody to still grip a pencil or to pick up a cup or to do those kinds of things. But a foot just has a very different job and it's, it's sort of stuck between the past and the present. I view the foot, well, we'll talk about transitional anatomy and transitional organisms at the end. Um, and I will bring the foot back up because the foot, I think, and humans are actually a good example of a transitional organism because the, the foot has some features that, that give it these sort of modern attributes that, that, that make it so that we can walk long distances. We're incredible at walking long distances. But at the same time, it's kind of stuck in the past with all these parts. And that's, that's why we end up spraining ankles and, and having sort of difficulties with our feet. Another one that comes to mind in the body is the and this is not just in our body, it's kind of worse in our body for reasons I'll discuss, but it's the intersection of our airway and our esophagus. That would be a ridiculous setup to put the, the, the opening for, for air and the opening for food right next to one another if you were designing a body. You would just want to put the, the op I, I sometimes think about if I, was, if I were designing a body, I would just put the opening for food right there down by the stomach and you'd have a little grinding structure down there and you complete keep it completely separate yeah. from, the, from, from the lungs. But but the lungs and the air passageways, they evolved as, as little out pockets from the esophagus. That's how they evolved. You can't, you know, evolution has to, again, work with pre-existing structures. So there was already a tube in place, little air pockets sort of came out of that tube. And as a consequence, the airway and the esophagus are intimately linked and they're very close to one another. There's some fail-safe mechanisms in there, the epiglottis, sort of helps to kind of keep everything where it's supposed to go, kind of covers up the airway when you're swallowing. But even that doesn't work perfectly. And it, and it especially doesn't work perfectly in humans because we've lowered all of that anatomy up in animals. All that, that laryngeal anatomy is very high in their throats. And they get a pretty good separation as a consequence, just to sort of separate it early on. But in humans, all that anatomy lowered down to here to our, where our voice box is. And so our epiglottis is very low now. And as a consequence, we're very prone to choking. And yeah. that's another compelling anatomical piece of evidence. One of the classic ones, stepping outside of humans for a second, one of the classic ones is the laryngeal nerve in, in mammals and in particularly in giraffes. So the laryngeal nerve is this, this branch off of a cranial nerve called the vagus nerve that in, in fish, it just makes this short little passageway. It sort of dips under their aorta and then it goes over to their gills. And it's just a short little trip in fish for that nerve. But as animals evolved and, and amphibians and reptiles and on into mammals, that, you know, and you ended up with separation of the, of the neck and the shoulder girdle, that pathway became a little bit longer. And you think about what it's like in humans for that, for that nerve. It has to drop down and it still dips under the aorta. So in humans now, when we're starting up here and we're coming all the way down and we're dipping under the aorta and we're coming back up. And of course, I don't have gills, but I, it now innervates parts of the, the vocal anatomy, the larynx. So even in a human, it has a, a relatively long trip. 
and you move to something like a giraffe, <laughs> the, yeah. the nerve starts up, the nerve starts up in their head and their brain. It comes down, it goes runs all the way down their neck, loops around the aorta, comes all the way back up, and 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 innervates parts of their laryngeal anatomy. And in, in a giraffe, it's a total of between four and five meters that that nerve has to run. It would be the most ridiculous design ever. You know, you would just go whoop straight across the straight across the neck if you were designing the thing. So and of course, because giraffes started off as short-necked animals and they yeah. evolved to, for whatever reason to have these longer necks and uh, it had to follow suit, didn't it? Just had to follow suit. You can't just start and make a new one out of, you know, out of nothing. So it just had to sort of work with what they had. And that has led to this ridiculously long laryngeal nerve. I mean, ours has got ours is also unnecessarily long. We have pretty long necks, and our and our heart is going quite you know, separated from our head. But it, even ours has to sort of dip around there. But theirs is theirs is really ridiculous. Well, next on the list is modern molecular evidence, and this means getting right down to the DNA. Isn't that right? Yeah, so for this, we, we have to dive inside the cell and we sort of, you know, leave the macro anatomy behind and, and start looking at the, the micro microstructures. And this is evidence that's really come to light since it's gotten a lot cheaper and a lot easier to do molecular biology, which has really happened in the last couple of generations, you know, starting with tools like, like PCR, which allowed us to amplify DNA. And then now, you know, all the way up to sort of modern, modern tools like like CRISPR, which is allowing for, for genetic mm -hmm. editing. And through all of that time, we've compiled new pieces of evidence for evolution that have come out of the molecular work. And one of, I, one of the most interesting ones for me are the banding patterns on chromosomes. So chromosomes are the little stru the structures inside the nuclei that where, where the DNA is, the, the, the packages for the DNA, little shoestrings of DNA inside the nuclei. Those are the yes. those are the chromosomes. And if you stain them with a dye, they have these particular banding patterns, they're called. Each chromosome stains in a particular way. And so if you look at the number, starting with the number of chromosomes is sort of where this discussion starts. So humans have 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. And all of the other great apes, so that's chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, bonobos, all the other living great apes, which is which are our closest living relatives. I always stress whenever I talk about evolution, we didn't descend from any of those creatures. They're just sort of our closest living cousins, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. All of the rest of them have 48 chromosomes. And so that kind of kicks out the hypothesis that at some point in the last six million years since we've so, since we split from those you know, since since the last split from those groups that's sort of the time frame around when the chimpanzees and humans went on their own evolutionary paths and diverged some point along our path along our unique path to becoming humans that evidence suggests that there might have been a chromosome fusion to take us from 48 down to 46 chromosomes. Well, there's your hypothesis. And, and predictions are born of hypotheses. It's sort of how science works. You start with an observation and you have, that's the number of chromosomes. Then you have a hypothesis that maybe a fusion occurred. And then that generates predictions. And if that hypothesis is supported, you would, you would be able to find a banding pattern on a human chromosome that looked like two of the great ape ones fused together. If, uh, if in fact this fusion took place. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happens. If you look at the banding patterns across all the chromosomes, there mm -hmm. are two grade ape chromosomes, it's numbers 12 and 13, that if you stick those two together and look at the banding pattern, it perfectly aligns with human chromosome number two. So there's very strong and compelling evidence that that one of our chromosomes was the result of a fusion event um, sometime in the last six million years. And we know that this kind of thing can take place. The chromosome fusions are not are not a hypothetical. They've even discovered a living human in China who has a who has a chromosome reduction from 46 to 44. So he's a perfectly healthy, fine male with two fewer chromosomes and and at some point, the evidence suggests in our evolutionary past, we reduced from 48 to 46. And that group of people 
that had 46 chromosomes. Somehow, I'm, and I've never read a great explanation for, for how this happened, but somehow that group became the group that, that took over and populated the Earth. And you can see evidence for it in the banding patterns of those chromosomes. And the other sort of way to look at this is, is moving beyond the chromosomes and looking at the genome as a whole, which is something that, that can now be done. Um, and, and for, you know, and so even in just the last 10 or 20 years, our ability to sequence a genome, I think about when I was in graduate school, just the amount of grant money I had to generate to just sequence a couple of genes out of the organism I was working on. And now you can do entire genomes from organisms for a fraction of that cost. And what that has allowed for is a comparison of genomes from us and sort of everything back down our evolutionary tree. And what we've discovered there is that our genomes can have share a striking you know, number of features and it's just a striking percentage of the DNA is identical from us compared to a compared to the other great apes, like somewhere between 96 and 98 percent of human and chimpanzee DNA is the same. It's 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 engendered a, a total reworking of the taxonomic classification system. Like when I was taught taxonomy going through school, we were the only members of our family hominidae because we hadn't sequenced DNA from everything else. And we thought we were very special and unique. And it turns out once you've sequenced the DNA, mm -hmm. chimpanzee DNA is 97, 98% identical to human DNA. They've gone ahead and done the right thing, which has moved all those other great apes into the same taxonomic family as humans, yes. because they're so genetically similar to humans. You can, so you can see the molecular evidence for evolution at the level of a whole genome. And the other way that you can do it is just by looking at individual proteins. And I, I think this is really interesting. So proteins, of course, are coded for by DNA. So if you just look at the sequence of the amino acid sequence, that's what the, that's what the DNA does, is it tells the cell what order to put those amino acids in. If you, if you just look at the amino acid sequence of a conserved protein, one that sort of all animals have to have and have to use, you can get a really interesting sense of evolutionary relationships and and how animals evolved. So one of the proteins that they use for this kind of work is called cytochrome C. It's this protein mm. involved in cellular respiration. So cellular respiration, the process by which animals harvest energy from building block molecules that they bring into their bodies. So you take glucose in and through the process of cellular respiration, you, you sort of do this conversion to put it into a form ATP that every cell in the body can use. And everything has to do this, everything from bacteria, through you know rhododendrons, through through porcupines, all the way up to humans, everything has to do this process of cellular respiration. So everything has this protein, cytochrome C. But you can compare the sequences of that protein in different animals and even plants and fungi to see how closely related things are. And if evolution works the way that we think it does, then organisms that we think are more closely related, like us and the great apes, they'll have fewer differences in their cytochrome C. Um, protein sequences. And, and that's exactly the way the evidence shakes down. Like if you compare the cytochrome C sequence in a human and a chimpanzee, there are zero differences between the two. You move to a different kind of primate that's not as closely related to us, like a rhesus monkey or something like that, and maybe there's one difference. Dogs and cats, there'll be a dozen differences. And as you move further down the mammalian tree, you you get you know more and more differences and move to a non-mammal, move to like a rattlesnake or something, and they have 20 differences in their cytochrome C protein between us and them, all the way out to things that are not even animals, and you'll get now dozens of differences. And it just perfectly aligns with how we understand that, that humans evolve from, from more primitive and then other different types of animals. So the molecular evidence, you can see it at the level of chromosomes, you can see it at the level of the genome, you can see it at the level of individual proteins, and all along the way it supports this idea that the diversity of life on Earth did in fact evolve and, and was sort of built upon simpler forms all the way through to what we have today. And of course, Alex, Darwin didn't even know about any of this, and yet it all seems to be lining up. None of it. Yeah, that, that's what's so amazing about this 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 theory of evolution is that Darwin knew none of this. They had no look inside the cell. And even in the face of, of a complete revolution in the field of biology, the theory of evolution has held up. Well, one of the most fascinating visual clues for evolution at work are vestigial features. That is, features that appear on modern living things, but that harken back 
to an older evolutionary time. Alex, what are some of the most striking vestigial forms that you have for us? Okay, it's a great question, and I love this question because we can go back to our bodies and just find some things on our bodies that are examples of vestigial structure. So let's start by just talking about what a vestigial structure hmm. is. I think it's important to recognize that a vestigial structure, they are common features that are found in animals. So these aren't rare features. These are, these are things that most, if not all, members of a species will have. Um, but that don't really necessarily retain much of a function. Sometimes they have a little bit of a function, but they don't retain much of a function in their modern mm -hmm. form. So we'll contrast that in a second with what are known as atavistic structures, which are, which are ones that are only rarely seen in a, in a species that harken back to you know, deep, deep evolutionary times for that species. So yes. anyway, first vestigial. So one of my favorite examples of a vestigial structure, I'm just going to get really close to the camera, is that little nub right there in the medial portion of your eye. That little piece of membrane wow. right there is called the nictitating yep. membrane. It is a leftover remnant of the third eyelid that many mammals have. People are familiar with this if they've spent any time around cats and dogs. It's, it's some, the colloquial name for it is the haw. And cats hmm. and dogs, if you if you catch them right in the middle of a really deep nap, or sometimes if they've gotten a little bit sick, they'll they'll cover up their eyes with that third eyelid. It's an important structure for animals that end up sort of in close, you know, close to one another as they end up scratching at each other. They can put that, it's like almost like having a pair of goggles. They can slip over their eyes for when they fight. Um, in our past, it might have been helpful for for when we that we went through this long period of time where where we had to where we ate grasses and had our heads down in these and, and in this in this environment where, where it was possible that we might have gotten our eyes scratched um i don't think anybody knows exactly why and, and how we used it in our evolutionary past or when it went away but there's a little leftover remnant of it in the corner of everyone's eye that you can see this little piece of our evolutionary history sticking there from when from when somewhere in our past human ancestors had this nictitating membrane um Another really good example is are the the muscles that are underneath the skin that are connected to the hair follicles called the erector pili muscles. These are ones that harken back to a time when we were covered, when this arm would have been covered in fur. And if I got cold, those little muscles can contract and fluff up your hair and in such a way to trap the heat or to send a signal to an animal, you know, to sort of make yourself look bigger. My cats do this all the time if I freak out one of my cats. Her tail about triples in size, and some of that is the erector pili muscles contracting and all her hair fluffing up. And humans absolutely still have these erector pili muscles, even though there's very little hair on this arm now. When you get cold, those little muscles still contract and you get goosebumps, goose flesh. And that's a nice um, example that as everyone has experienced of a vestigial structure doesn't really serve much of a function anymore. It's not doing anything. I can't fluff my hair up. There's hardly any hair on my arms. Um, but a good example of a structure that we would have used in our past. Um, the classic one that I think is sort of falling out of favor as new evidence comes to light, like sometimes, you know, the way we have to view science changes as new evidence comes to light is the appendix. You know, mm. maybe I had my appendix out as a kid when I was 18 years old. And at the time, everybody just sort of talked about, oh, that's just a vestigial structure. You don't really need it anyway. And it'll be fine. And it has been fine. I mean, I've made it through and it hasn't been too big a deal. But some new evidence has come to light that the appendix may actually have a functional role. There's this, this new idea that it's a kind of a safe house for bacteria, that if you have sort of a disruptive gut event and you need to repopulate your gut with, with healthy bacteria, that the appendix can sort of re-inoculate things and kind of get you going like having a like having a probiotic a little place in there where you just sort of have a stash of probiotics to kind of get you started again and there's been some some interesting papers written and some interesting experiments run that suggest that maybe the appendix isn't quite as vestigial as we thought my my last example and, and one of my favorite ones for humans i don't think you'll be able to see it in my arm let's see if i can get it actually you kind of can that tendon yes. right there so that, that tendon right there, that big tendon right there is called um, flexor carpi radialis. It is one of the flexor tendons that runs out towards your, towards your thumb and helps you flex your wrist. And if, if people bend their wrists or toward themselves and give a good flex, what you will see there is in about 
three-fourths of people, there will be two tendons running right there, one next to the other. One's flexi carpi radi flexor carpi radialis. The other is the tendon of a very small little muscle called palmaris longus. It's another flexor that some people have. So this is a really interesting one. Not everybody has palmaris longus. It's about two-thirds, three-fourths of people have it. Some people have it in one arm. Some people have it in both arms. And some people like, like me are missing it entirely in both arms. It is largely vestigial. It helps a little bit with flexion, but not in a way that we really use much anymore. It sort of helps there for gripping and grasping. So that's a really great example that people can look for on their own bodies of this largely vestigial structure that is almost sort of transitioning to becoming atavistic and becoming, you know, I could see where it, it, there'd be a time in the future where very few people may have pulmaris longus since we don't really use it much anymore. So that's kind of a nice bridge to atavistic structures, which I think are also compelling evidence for evolution. So these, this is a slightly different topic. These are structures that are rare in an organism, um, but sort of they pop up because there are elements of the DNA. So it's an, an important thing to understand about DNA is that at any given time, we're using very little of our DNA. A lot of it is sort of sitting in the genome, regulating the rest of it and not being actively coded. I equate it to the way that sort of the, the DNA and the genome has built up over evolutionary time. I think of it as a, as a, a word document. So you're, you know, you're working on an essay and you're drafting it and you go to change something. But instead of, you know, in a Word document, we would just delete the, the old sentence or the old paragraph and we type in a new one. But in the genome, it's really common for you just to end up with a copy of the old sequence still in the genome. And you could just think of it as maybe being crossed out. Yeah. And then you have the new version sort of sitting there next to it. And for the most part, our bodies use the newer version of the DNA and they leave that old copy alone. But it's still there in the genome in many cases, sitting there, just kind of in its crossed out form, if you will. Well, an atavistic structure is one where for whatever reason, the cell reads the old form, the crossed out form and makes that protein and makes that structure in an individual. So examples of this include extra nipples on individuals, which happens in like two or 3% of people have, have an extra, at least one extra nipple. You know, you go far enough back and our, and our ancestors would have had more than just the two that we have. So that's, that's an example. Another one that's kind of wild is children being born, babies being born with a short little caudal appendage, a short little tail, whereas developmentally the new sort of form of the, the genes and the DNA would, you know, that, that tail largely just sort of shrinks up and becomes the very bottom part of the tailbone, the coccyx. That's the way it works in most people. But in once every now and again, Mm -hmm. The kid is born with a sort of a longer extended version of that. And it's not that big a deal. They just surgically take care of it right at birth. But it's very great evidence for the fact that, that we are descended okay. from animals that, that at one point had DNA that coded for a much longer, different kind of tail. Um, you can step out of humans for, for, this, uh, for this topic, atavistic structures. I think one of the most interesting ones I've ever heard about is just, I think it was four or five years ago, there were some fishermen in Japan that came across a dolphin that had hind limbs that were that were actually sort of you know coming off of the the sort of posterior mm. portion of the animal there were these sort of almost hand like hand but they were about hand in size they didn't have fingers or anything but they're about hand sized structures that were hind limbs on this dolphin and so it's it's been known to this point that dolphins and whales their hind bones reduced greatly when they made the transition from land into sea. They're descended from ungulates. And if you look at a whale skeleton, um, you can see they have vestigial hind limbs in their hind limbs and as part of their skeletons um, that don't really have much of a function. That's been known for a long time. But this was the first case I had ever heard of where instead of just a vestigial part of their skeleton showing up, you know, there was actually a, a whole extra fin, a whole extra limb popping out on this dolphin, which is a really compelling evidence of an atavistic structure in a, in a whale, dolphins just being toothed whales, and, and spectacular evidence for evolution. I think another really interesting example of an atavistic structure, for this one we have to step outside of humans um, and look at 
whales. So whales have a really interesting evolutionary history. They are descended from land animals. So they're descended from ungulates that were, that were of course living on land. And then, and then for whatever reason, some members of that group returned over time, didn't happen just overnight, but you know, over this transitional period returned to the water. And so you can see the all kinds of, of features of their anatomy that that are sort of transitional and you can see vestigial and atavistic and occasionally atavistic structures in whales. So hmm. vestigial structures would include the evidence of their hind limbs and their skeleton, which have largely shrunken down and don't really have much of a use anymore as the bodies have become much more streamlined in a whale. But if you see, I've, I've gotten to go to a couple of museums that have giant you know, blue whale skeletons and you can go back there and see these teeny little hind limb vestigial bones, which is really neat to see. And once every blue moon, this happened a couple of years, a few years ago off the, in, in Japan with some fishermen, they discovered a dolphin that had hind limbs actually present in the dolphin. You know, these little sort of hand size fins, yeah. limbs, whatever you want to call them, that they discovered on this dolphin that they had come across. So you can see vestigial and atavistic structures sometimes, if you know what you're kind of, you know, if, you're, if you're keeping an eye out, you'll sometimes see them pop up in other organisms. Well, anyone with a passing interest in evolution will no doubt have heard of transitional forms, animals that have popped up in the fossil record with a mixture of primitive and new features. Alex, can you first of all explain in detail what is meant by a transitional form, and then can you give us some of your best examples? Yeah, you bet. Transitional forms are, are one of the most one of the most interesting things to talk about in class. I lead right away with them in, in some of my ecology and evolution classes because they just grab the student's attention and they're so interesting. So a transition, a transitional form is just a an organism that, that sort of shows the evolutionary steps moving from one lineage to another. I think it's it's most dramatically seen when you have a group of animals that is transitioning from one environment to another. So maybe from land to sea or from sea to land or land to air forest down to plains, something like that. Um, you know, let's let's keep the discussion uh, centered around whales just for a second, since that's where we just were as a nice transition mm -hmm. out of vestigial and atavistic. So whales, as I said, they, they have this fascinating evolutionary history where they, they you know, transition from, from land back into sea. And that's not something that that is simple to do. So there's a there's quite a period over millions of years where you can see, and there's spectacular fossil evidence for this, showing sort of every little change that had to take place, documenting the transitional forms as that change occurred. The, the University of California at Berkeley has put together a great site that sort of shows all the different organisms, all the different fossils as their bodies change, and you end up, you know, as they move into the water over that period of time, they end up with sort of shorter, stubbier legs rather than the typically sort of longer legs of ungulates. The, the, the shape of the feet changes. They come, become a little more paddle-like, if you will. The, kind of, the skeletons kind of reminds you of the, what a hippo looks like. A hippo you know, didn't, mm -hmm. didn't go back into the ocean, but a hippo you know, is an aquatic ungulate that is the closest living relative of whales. And the, the, the ungulates that ended up going back into the ocean that became whales and dolphins, they, they sort of have these bodies that, that ended up a little more in the transitional form, a little more hippo-like, and then it just became even more streamlined and streamlined until you end up with the, the current form today. Um, you can see other places in their body when the, where, where the transitions take place. One of the most compelling ones is the, the location of the blowhole. So if you look at skulls from the whales that were right at that transition 50 million years ago, the blowhole is very much, you know, in the, the, there is, it is their nose. It's at the front of their face, kind of like you would expect in any other ungulate. And then if you move, you know, closer to current time, maybe 40 million years ago, it's moved back a little bit on the skull. And then, and then another 10 million years, it's even further back. And in the current whales and dolphins, it's all the way sort of back behind their eyes on the top of the head almost, you know, making it easier for them to rise to the surface to breathe air. I mean, just the fact that they have to breathe air is very <laughs> simple, basic, solid evidence for evolution. Well, yes. you, wouldn't, you wouldn't design a whale and make it so that the poor thing had to like pop up and get a fresh breath of air every single. Just have, you know, it just would have gills like a fish if you're just going to design the thing. That's not how it works. You know, it got it, it, it evolved from a land animal that that went back into the water. So every now and again, it has to pop back up and breathe air. So between the air breathing and the hole, and the blowhole, you've got just to, just in that one group of organisms alone, you have some very very solid evidence for evolution. 
There, another one I like to talk about in, um, with my students and in class is the, because what's neat about this one is it's been discovered very recently. It's in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years that this fossil has been discovered, which is the transitional organism for the, the bridge from, from going the, you know, going back further in time. Now we're back like 375 million years ago from organisms in the, from fish in the sea to, to sort of proto amphibians on land. And that fossil is of course, tiktaalik which was discovered by a group up in the Arctic. And it has, so the tiktaalik fossil has very fish-like features. So, you know, with a transitional organism, you would expect kind of a blend of features from the two environments. So it has very fish-like features. It has gills and fins and scales, but then it also has very amphibian-like features. It has these sturdier wrist bones that allow it to sort of prop itself up in shallow water. And it has a real separation, like, of its shoulders from its skull so it has a like a neck which is not something that fish really have much of a neck it has thicker ribs all these things that are very different than that's right than fish so it is even though it's very a very recent piece of evidence it is already kind of becoming a classic transitional fossil in the field one that's been around quite a bit longer um that that people know that, that a lot of people know about is the transition from dinosaurs to birds birds just being sort of the living descendants of a group of dinosaurs and we understand that now from from both anatomical evidence and molecular evidence and this this classic fossil is called archaeopteryx it was this sort of dinosaur that was transitioning to to becoming a bird it had teeth which is a very dinosaur-like feature. It had this long bony tail. It had claws. Those are kind of its dinosaur-like features, but it was also very sort of bird-like, right? It had wings. I mean, just on the wing alone, just the wing is spectacularly transitional. It's a wing with claws. Like they have the wildest looking <laughs> wings. It's got feathers. It has a wishbone. It has all these bird-like features. So there's something that's, that's very much caught in the middle of this transition. And, you know, most of the most of the dinosaurs did not make it through any kind of transition. Most of them got wiped out, but there were a few that managed to survive and they're flying outside my office as starlings uh, today. Um, to, uh, to bring it kind of full circle with transitional organs, I, I think the most interesting one are the one you're, that you're looking at. I think humans are a great example of a transitional organism. I like to come back to the foot. So we, we kind of gave the foot a hard time right at the beginning, all these, all these different bones, and how they just really cause trouble for, for what we need the foot to do. But over the last 5 million years, as humans have gotten used to be to being bipedal organisms, there have been some very interesting adaptations to the foot that, that help us cover long distances. One of them you can see right there. One of them is the shape of the foot. We have an arch that mm -hmm. is held in place by tendons and ligaments that sort of acts like a spring in our step and helps return a little bit of energy with every step. Um, another is a big, giant, fat Achilles tendon that kind of works the same way. It helps us be very energetically efficient on two feet. We have huge heel bones that help us to take this because the calcaneus bone at the back of the foot helps you to kind of absorb that pounding. And you have a foot, a foot that's very much mired in this transition between past, all these different bones that we don't really need to have in there for all the flexibility, and present, where there are some features that that make us spectacular as as bipedal organisms. We can cover long distances very efficiently and very well. So I I like the human anatomy also as a I think, you know, if they come back and look at us and study us millions and millions of years from now, I think we will be considered kind of a, a classic transitional organism. <laughs> Of course, anyone who doubts the viability of evolution as the best explanation for the diversity of life on Earth has to not only look at these evidences, but also has to acknowledge that new evidences are presenting themselves all the time. Isn't that right? Yeah, that is right. You just, you know, you kind of have to know where to look, I guess, um, and and be willing to come into it with an open mind. And, and also, there have been some scientists that have run some really clever and industrious experiments that, that give us really great evidence for evolution. One of the, one of my favorites is this, there's this Michigan State professor, um, Richard Lenski, that he's been, he's been keeping a pop, uh, multiple strains of E. coli going in his lab for, for over 30 years now. So what he did, he started, he started 30, 35 years ago with, with 12 identical strains of the bacteria E. coli. And then he 
He held all the variables as constant as he could. So he gave them the same amount of food. He gave them the same amount of light. He kept all those populations the same. He just, but he, but he didn't let them interact. He didn't let them, you know, that they couldn't mm. cohabitate. They were kept independent from one another, which meant that they evolved independently from one another. And every day they reproduce pretty quickly, which is why it works great to use an, an organism like that for experiments in evolution. Is you can you can see what happens in sort of rapid time. And so every day they would make six or seven. You know, they they the populations would double every every day several times. And and now all these years later, we're, he's he's gone through seventy five thousand generations, seventy five thousand generations, with these twelve populations that were identical to begin with. And now we can look for differences between them. And he has looked for differences all along the way. And the results are striking. I, I like to stress to anybody, you know, my students, whoever, that I try to keep the definition of evolution very simple. It's just, it's just gene frequency change in a population over time. That's it. If the genes in a population change over time, doesn't matter if that's two weeks, six months, a year, or 10 million years, if the genes in a population change over time, that's evolution. And he has seen significant and rapid evolution in this experiment. So, so the bacteria in all of these different strains, they've gone about it a very different way, but they've all grown a bit larger. They've all started to reproduce much in a much more rapid rate. So the, one of the strains tapped into a completely different fuel source than the other ones. It started to digest citrate, this different sort of carbon source that was in its medium, that none of the others acquired a mutation that allowed it to do that. Of course, over time, each of these strains ends up with different mutations. Most of those get washed out. Most of those have a bad effect or a negative effect. But every now and again, one of them has a positive effect. And it pushes that strain in a different direction. So here's an experiment in real time, in our lifetimes, that has demonstrated dramatic evolution in this one species. Um, we live with evolution all the time with pathogenic disease. Uh, the, the way that we've sort of started to overuse and misuse antibiotics and subject bacteria to these, these strong and artificial selective pressures has forced the evolution of bacteria in ways that have led to antibiotic resistant forms of, of bacteria like MRSA, which is a huge problem in many healthcare communities. And of course, the one that that is so relevant to our lives in the last three years is looking at the evolution of COVID. COVID has changed dramatically since it first sort of popped up on our radar three years ago. The the frequency of genes in the COVID genome in the in the populations of COVID have changed over over the last three years. That is evolution. It started as a form that was quite lethal. I mean that was the whole problem. It was transmissible, but not, not spectacularly transmissible at the beginning, which is why some of the, the measures that were taken into place, the quarantining and the social distancing and those things had a, had a good effect, was that, that we could sort of control it because it wasn't ridiculously transmissible. And now three years later, as we've moved through Delta and Omicron and all the different variants, it's changed quite a bit. Like its mm -hmm. lethality has dropped significantly. That is the virus evolving and it has become far more transmissible so it's sort of it's 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 morphed into this now what will be an endemic you know the fifth endemic coronavirus in, in human populations but it's morphed into a form that that we're going to have to learn to live with and we've had to change the vaccines as a consequence as it has changed and it's evolution happening in real time with with sort of humans as a host and so you haven't had to look any further than the last three years for, for evidence of evolution. Well, it's been great having you back on the show, Alex. You always present science in a very easy to understand and exciting way. I will leave links to Evolution Gone Wrong as well as your social media in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you once again for coming on to Evolution Soup. Thanks a lot for having me, Mark. I'm always open and, and, and happy to talk about biology. It's just, it's my passion. It's what I do. It's what I you know spend my all my days just talking to students about these subjects. And any chance to sort of spread the word about science is, is good as far as I'm concerned. So thanks again for having me. Which animal climbs down from its tree once a week to do its business? A. Koala bear B. 
three-toed sloth, C. Common ringtail possum, D. Spider monkey. I would be willing to bet at least one of these statements is true about you. You had your wisdom teeth pulled. You wear glasses or contacts. You snore. You have sore feet. You have back pain. If you are unlucky, all of those statements might be true. You have probably spent considerable time and money in an effort to alleviate the pain and discomfort from such ailments, from dental work to prescription lenses, pharmaceuticals to customized mattresses. Humans spend a lifetime trying to relieve symptoms caused by their anatomical imperfections. But have you ever stopped to consider why those aches and pains occur in the first place? Why don't our teeth fit in our mouths? Why do so many people have blurry vision? Why are our knees and ankles always getting sprained and twisted? Why are our backs so delicate we have to worry every time we bend over to pick something up? It is not just the aged who suffer from these maladies. Seemingly from birth, humans are uniquely prone to bodily discomfort and malfunction. This book is about the aches and pains of the masses and why they happen. It is not about obscure conditions you only ever hear about from some ant you see during the holidays. It is about your body and why it often does not work as well as you might hope or expect. Don't worry. The book is not a long, drawn-out guilt trip. The focus is not on all the problems humans bring upon themselves with their unhealthy behaviors. Thus, topics like atherosclerosis, lung disease, and cavities are off the table. I am not going to give you a hard time about your diet, how much you exercise, or how infrequently you floss. Instead, this book will provide explanations for anatomical imperfections that are not your fault, like having crooked teeth, or flat feet, or waking up with a sore lower back. But why do those issues happen? What happened along the long, complicated arc of human evolution to leave us with bodies that fail us in such predictable ways?